So I was thinking through what I could do today. And I think uh, this is something that I've done uh, for my astronomy class, but I think it might be uh, worthwhile to do here. So this is, uh, it's just a link to a website for the software. It's technically a game. Um, uh, there is a free version that I think available here. Um, I'm going to use the one that I bought on Steam. Um, it's a, well, I guess they're calling it Universal Simulator. It, it's a really a, a good software for illustrating some of the things in astronomy. Uh, you do have to be careful to, especially when you're using for real world um, uh, demonstration, uh, you have to turn off what's called a procedural object. But um, so, so I just want you to, um, um, just to play with it and um, and kind of talk over some things. So so yeah. So let me do that. Uh, I'm let me do it this way. So let me run the space engine, and um, I think I have to change my share setting. I have uh, this vague recollection of um, doing the normal Zoom share setting with the space engine before and um doesn't quite come through right so so my experience running this software in the um in previous classes <laughs> was with the zoom's regular share setting i think this comes um it's a, trying to send it through too high resolution so i'm going to just change my share setting so that it's uh, um so that it's optimized for video clip. Uh, I'll, I'll see how well that goes. It's, um, um, it, 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 so, it, this is a quite demanding software. It actually um, um, it uses a fair amount of computing power, both in terms of the CPU and GPU. And <laughs> I have a laptop that I got this past May that, um, that's more powerful than any of the computers I've had. Um, before then, running this software wouldn't really have been possible and have a smooth-ish Zoom experience. So anyways, um, so I changed the uh, settings. Hopefully, it'll turn out a little bit better. So this is a, a planetarium software. Let me just do a couple of things here. Um, I'm gonna turn off the orbit because that's a, uh, it's useful for some things, but I'll do that later. Uh, let me see here. Let me go to the more familiar view first, <laughs> planet Earth. And, um, it, it's, and as I was saying, it's a, technically a game. It's a, uh, you can, I guess it's a kind of a odd kind of game, even odder than Minecraft, because even in Minecraft you can, uh, you know, affect the world you are in. This is a more of a, um, a spectator kind of game, so you can look at the uh, things. Let's see, are we on real time now? No, that's not real time. Let me try to change to yeah. So this is real time. This is right now, today, and. Let me see. I feel like I'm upside down on this. Uh, let me just, uh, because uh, that's uh, South Pole and that's uh, on the uh, top side here. So there's some, a bit of um, control that I want explain, over explain. Um, so, you know, I'm using mouse for control and uh, depending on whether I'm clicking the left button or right button, the how the camera view changes the shifts and, um, there's a whole shortcut of things that uh, I try to remember. Uh, if I forget and I need to look it up, I'll come back here and look it up. Um, so um, what I want to start out with, uh, can I just close this, uh, with this, a bit of a familiar view. I think I'm almost there. Oh, right, uh, because, uh, so it is real time. So it'll show uh, when I, go to the North America view, um, uh, we, we are at night. <laughs> and one of the advantage of a simulation is that you are not restricted to uh, real world limitations of like looking at um, things as they are now. Um, you can easily turn back the time and go back in time so that, um, wait, yeah, I gotta, sorry, keep up with it. Um, 
go back in time so that you can see this uh, landscape before the sunset. And it's a quite detailed uh, simulation. Let's go back to uh, just regular flow of time. And I struggle each time trying to find a Bay Area on this view. So, you know, I'm, this is, I think, Baja California. Um, so somewhere here is California. Um, don't think, I think I need to zoom in a little bit more to be able to identify where <laughs> our area is, Bay Area. Um, let's see, I'm pretty sure, oh, 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 I'm a little too fast. I think, let's see, that doesn't look like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's way up in uh, Washington or something. Um, I think it's, I wish I, I don't know how to turn off the clouds. The clouds are kind of in the way. Um, I think if I go a little bit lower, it'll be easier to see. Uh, I think if I move along the coastline, I can probably identify where uh, our Bay Area is. Ah, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> I see the bay, <laughs> and this is where uh, Golden Gate Bridge is. So, um, it's got, you know, uh, things like uh, distances. So, when it looks like I'm zooming out and in, I'm actually changing the distance. Um, there should be... Oh, where? oh, I think I'm close enough that it's actually just showing the latitude, longitude, and height. So, anyways... Um, so, you know, it's a quite detailed simulation that so I can uh, look at this uh, uh, area of Earth. I think uh, I couldn't really find Alameda here. Um, some around here should be Berkeley, and I guess maybe that's a Lake Merritt. But um, so, you know, it's a, uh, I don't know why it's rotating. I think it might be trying to land me. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, so you can actually land um, and look at uh, things from a landed uh, point of view. But uh, so <laughs> this would be kind of a very small portion of this software that's uh, really not what it's uh, best for, because this is just uh, exploring a uh, very featureless um, version of our planet. So, okay, so that's not the best thing to do. Let me just go back to orbit. Um, you can simulate observation of astronomical events. So I think one of the interesting things that's happened recently is the solar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse at, in the uh, southern um, or Antarctic that on December 4th. I looked it up. So, so let me do this. Uh, let me just simulate that, um, um, that event of the uh, the solar eclipse occurring somewhere in this uh, region. So I'm just going to turn back the time to December 4th, and uh, I'll pretend that I don't know the exact time. So I'll just start from, uh, start from the beginning of the day. So that's uh, December 4th, um, sometime near when the eclipse should be occurring, and I'm somewhere near the South Pole. So um, to pinpoint when the eclipse should be happening, I can look for the moon. There it is. Um, and when I click OK, it'll just select the moon so that I can look for the cursor and locate the moon. It should be somewhere near the sun. Uh, yeah, there it is. And, um, and so I can... Um, use uh, something that's uh, analogous to a, tele well, that is uh, actually like a telescope, as in, so within this simulation, there's a location of this spaceship observer that's uh, a place in a three-dimensional location. And what I've been using as a kind of zoom in and out, that's actually changing the location of the observer. You can see here, the distance. When I zoom in, the distance actually changes because I'm, uh, wait, uh, that's distance to the moon. The distance changes because as it's uh, zooming in and out, it's the position of the observer that's changing. Um, if you look at here, this field of view, that's the actual telescope where you are real, uh, actually zooming in like a telescope view uh, without changing the location of the observer. So I can, from this vantage point, 
I can look at the moon and the sun and kind of zoom in with the telescope. So I, my uh, vantage point hasn't changed. I'm still where I am, kind of hovering over Antarctic. And that's the moon. Um, it's the new moon, by which we really mean no moon, because the lead side of the moon is the other side. I'm going to um, um, move the time forward a little bit until where the moon is relatively close to the sun. I don't know if uh, from my current location, if I'll see the actual eclipse, because I'm hovering over Antarctic rather than being right at Antarctic and looking through. Yeah, so from my current vantage point, I'll just miss the moon. So, all right. Um, or miss the eclipse. The moon doesn't pass directly in front of the sun. But I think if I now turn around and look at the Antarctic, I might see a sign that... Hmm, I don't see anything yet. Let me just uh, pass the time forward a little bit and see if uh, I see anything changing that indicates that uh, eclipse is occurring. Yeah, maybe a little faster. Ah, uh, there it is. See that shadow? That is the region where solar eclipse is occurring. So um, there's a whole, I think there's a whole terminology for it, which I don't uh, remember. Like in the, is it penumbra? In this region, you should be seeing partial eclipse. If you're right in the middle here, you should be seeing total eclipse. The path of the, the shadow is the path of the total eclipse. So let me um, land in one of those shadows so that I can see, or I can simulate, what a solar eclipse looks like. I, I do have to um, put a disclaimer that I had a friend who, uh, there was a, was it three or four years ago? There was an eclipse that basically went through um, continental US and a lot of people kind of travel to different um, so, you know, it didn't go through California. So if you wanted to see total eclipse, you had to go up to Oregon or Washington. I had a friend who did that and, um, and he, um, he sounded a very, um, uh, I can't find the right word, but from his description, you know, it's a, the kind of experience that you do have to experience yourself. The little thing you see on the screen, I want to disclaim that it's not, um, it's a simulation and it's a, a very poor simulation. It's not going to give you the, it's not going to do justice to what a true eclipse looks like. But so from this location, somewhere within the uh, shadow cast by the total eclipse, let me look for where the sun and the moon is. I think I should uh, use this again. Okay. Um, okay. So that's where the sun. Ah, there it is. So, so um, let me just turn back the time a little bit so that we can go to the point in time where it's uh, just before eclipse was about to occur. somewhere here so it's a daytime or you know what passes for daytime at the uh, at the uh, southern pole because um the sunlight there is coming in a very steep and so what passes for day and uh yeah i think i'm on top of some kind of ice and uh, I'll zoom in a little bit. This 45 degree view is really much closer to a fisheye view. Uh, I think uh, what um, on most people's screen, what will look like a more natural kind of view would be something like this. So, um, so I'll just let the time run a little bit faster. And um, so I think at this speed, one second is about a minute. Uh, one second in our time is about a minute in the simulation time. So, so we are just uh, sitting somewhere, and uh, I'm gonna just track the sun so it doesn't keep moving. Um, and it, 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 as the um, and eclipse doesn't last uh, for very long. So this partial eclipse it's uh, starting at about seven thirty, and uh, so it's gonna be achieved totality in a little bit. So 
at uh, totality or close to totality, and that should last maybe 10 minutes. It, uh, or you know, 10 seconds in our simulation time, and now it's a partial, and and it goes from uh, day to night, back to day, and um, and what I'm told is, you know, so the kind of the view that you have at actual night is different from kind of view that you have um, during an eclipse. Uh, I guess the biggest difference would be you can kind of uh, get a sense of it in the simulation. So if it's just night, as in we are on the dark side of the planet, we would see the stars and you would have some kind of a view of the sky. Now, one thing that uh, that would be different between time of eclipse and night is so while it's uh, while the sun is at total eclipse, so you do have a view of something like this. So you could see that it kind of looks like a night. You can see the stars. In fact, there are uh, famous physics experiments that were done during the time of eclipse because they were looking at bending of light ray around the sun. So you have that, that looks kind of night. But look around here because um, you, you have this view of night by being in the shadow of the moon. So if you look around like near the horizon, you see the, the parts of the sky that's not in the shadow. So you see scattered light from there. And, and it's that, um, that's what the simulation is simulating. Again, uh, it's not meant to be a, any kind of adequate replacement for an actual experience of eclipse, which I haven't had the personally, but I've heard it described enough from someone who's familiar with the, all the physics and whatnot um, to, so anyway, so, so this is one of the things you can do with the software. You can simulate astronomical events like that. You can um, look at that event from different vantage points that are difficult to achieve um, in real life. Because, uh, you know, being hovering above South Pole, like <laughs> our current observation point, it's not something that's easy to do. Anyway, so, um, so that's uh, one of the things you can do with a simulation. Uh, let me go back to the current time. And uh, there are other things you can do with it. Uh, let me just go back to um, the regular view of Earth here. So I think that's Asia. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, United States right now at night. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, um, so just to kind of playing around, watching different things. That's one of the things you can do. So like uh, you can use this like a planetarium. You can look at a um, excellent simulation of night sky. These are some of the things that you can't see from where we are. Uh, these are the, the features in the sky visible only from Southern Hemisphere, uh, Magellanic clouds. Um, they are named after Magellan, one of the famous explorers because um, I guess uh, he's not the first one to see it. These are kind of huge things that look like a clouds in the, but you can only really see them from Southern Hemisphere because uh, they where they are, it, it's a, you know, um, if you're on the Northern Hemisphere, far up North enough, then these are obscured by the horizon. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I can locate Andromeda galaxy that easily, um, Let's see. I'll try for a bit, and then if I don't find it quickly, I will just uh, uh, use the search function. Um, well, I'm back to looking at uh, Andromeda Galaxy is somewhere in the northern hemisphere so let's say looking at earth from what am i saying there oh. <laughs> when you look around this it gets a very disorienting sometimes uh okay 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 i think uh, i can orient myself with those features okay and let me just look up to the somewhere in the northern hemisphere around here maybe um Ah, there it is. <laughs> so as you look at the 
night sky. Uh, so you know, most of the uh, that point of uh, light, they look like a point. You know, these are points, and um, there are some features that are nothing like a point at all. And Andromeda Galaxy is um, something that's big enough that it was. It's a discovery. is prehistoric. People, it's visible to the naked eye. And it's quite a large object, as in, oh, wait, I'm zooming. I should have, uh, wait, let me just make sure I know where Earth is. Okay, good. Earth is still where it roughly is. Um, and I was looking at yeah, here. So that object there, it used to be called, I think, Andromeda Nebula, because it looks like a nebulous kind of uh, lens shaped thing. It, um, it, so it, it stands out uh, by its size because it doesn't look like a point of light. And it's not the sun, it's not the moon. It, it's uh, in terms of angular size, it's uh, bigger than the planet. And let me zoom in like a zooming in with a telescope. So when you, um, as the people were actually observing Andromeda Galaxy, what we now know as Andromeda Galaxy with a telescope, they uh, saw these features and um, I think uh, it's an uh, um, accurate distance measurement to Andromeda Galaxy that established it as being something that must be outside of Milky Way Galaxy, our own galaxy. That's relatively recent. I think that happened somewhere in the 20th century, early 20th century. So, um, so well, this is a view of Andromeda Galaxy. Now, um, so all of this is an interesting thing to look at in an astronomy class, and I do um, now in a physics class, um, I guess, uh, it, you know, it, uh, other than just uh, appreciation for the natural world, uh, the, or the physics, <laughs> the natural world we live in, um, it might not um, look like a terribly relevant to physics. So let me... Uh, um, show something that has a more direct connection to what we've been covering. So one of the things I was thinking through, and that's why I thought demonstration of this software would be good, is um, the discussion of the gravitational interaction with the celestial bodies. Um, there was a, in the section of the Feynman lectures that I was reading through on Monday, uh, there's the one that talks about um, Earth falling towards the moon or something along that line. And you can see those orbital mechanics in this software. So I'm going to turn on the orbits um, of the things because that <laughs> helps me one, orient myself <laughs> and look for the uh, features of the things that I think would be interesting. Let me make sure I'm um, on the correct side of the hemisphere. Uh, just for consistency's sake, I want to be, uh, yeah, okay. I want to turn this around. Because most of the orbital pictures that are shown um, will normally place you so that north is up. That's what I'm trying to do. So that's the south. That's the Antarctica. So that's down. And this is the north, uh, which is up. Okay, good. So um, this, uh, so you see several lines drawn here. Uh, let me zoom out um, or, you know, move away from the Earth so that I can show some of these better. So right now I have Earth selected, and Earth is going in um, kind of two different kind of orbit. So there's a, a larger orbit of Earth around the Sun, and that orbit is represented by this line here. So to show that, I had to zoom way out. When I zoom way out <laughs> with the Sun in view, you can see this is the orbit of the uh, um, Earth and Moon system <laughs> around the Sun. Let me go back to, so what these orbits are describing is orbit of the Earth-Moon system around uh, each other. So, so, uh, so that's Moon. Uh, when I click it, it uh, instead of Moon, it will actually select uh, one of the Apollo spacecraft that's landed on the Moon. Let me um, use the search feature to select the Moon. So that's the moon. Uh, it looks like it's orbiting Earth, and that's the uh, description we can give of um, Earth as being, sorry, moon as being gravitationally bound to Earth. And this orbital motion of moon is uh, moon 
falling towards Earth in that if there was no gravity of Earth, it would be going in a straight line. So compared to that straight line, it's uh, falling um, away from that straight line uh, into this uh, circular-ish uh, uh, orbit. Now, I said I would demonstrate the, what Feynman was talking about, Earth falling towards the moon. So when you look here, um, Earth is not stationary. In the um, kind of Earth-Moon system, Earth itself is actually also orbiting. It's orbiting in this small circle here. And uh, the kind of the central point that Earth is orbiting around, and Moon is orbiting around actually as well, is this point here. This is what the program is calling planetary barycenter, or you know, center of mass. This point is the center of mass of Earth and Moon. So Earth is you know, massive enough that this center of mass of the Earth-Moon system, it lies inside the Earth. You can see as I uh, change my observation point around, it's just uh, inside the Earth. But Moon is also heavy enough. Moon is actually quite unusual amongst natural satellites in just how large it is compared to the, the major planet that is orbiting, that um, you know, this uh, center of mass is noticeably not at the center of Earth. It's uh, uh, this, um, offset quite a bit. And Earth is orbiting around this point. That's what this green orbit is showing. So, so yeah, that's, uh, um, <laughs> that's uh, what my man was talking about. The, you know, Earth, uh, just as the moon is falling, uh, moon is falling towards this point, center of mass, and Earth is also falling towards this point. So, so that's the Earth, the Moon, orbital mechanic. Um, by the way, um, uh, so for my real-time folks, if there are any questions, please. Um, so right now, so we are watching this in kind of a real time. So at, well, every second here is, um, every second in the simulation is also second in the, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, the, world that simulation is simulating but so so it's moving in the sense but um you know it takes the moon uh 29 days to orbit the earth so <laughs> unless we want to wait 29 days you wouldn't really see things move um so i can speed up the simulation which will so let me just uh, track um that center and I can speed up the simulation so that uh, every second in the simulation is maybe uh, so here. At this speed, uh, every second is several minutes. Um, that's not quite fast enough. So you can see the moon maybe move a little, but very slowly. Uh, I think this is where you would see the quarter moon, kind of so the sun should be somewhere over there. So that's 90 degrees. Um, can make it move faster. Um, so at this scale factor, every second is a couple hours. So now you can see the moon uh, visibly move. Um, and, and I can also make it move much faster so that the orbital motion happens more quickly. Uh, let me go back to our current time. And so uh, most of the time as I am demonstrating this, it'll be moving. Um, so this, um, well, I can tell you what my computer has. Uh, it has, uh, you know, I actually can. <laughs> the best thing probably is um, on the website, they actually have a minimum and recommended uh, system spec. You basically need a gaming computer. Um, a gaming computer of some, uh, some uh, I guess, capability. I think that there's a... Uh, system requirements here. So uh, minimum, you you do need a dedicated GPU. Um, so so I think if it has at least two gigabyte of dedicated memory, that's probably uh, within last four or five years. I have a another gaming laptop that was uh, purchased four years ago, and that could run this. And um, the one I have now um, has. I think it has six gigabyte of dedicated memory. Um, so, so it really comes down to <laughs> you need a gaming laptop. If you don't have uh, at least a dedicated GPU, then um, then the thing won't run. 
because it 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 takes a fair bit of uh, the kind of the processing you know that uh, that video games <laughs> need. It's a, and this is technically a game. It's a sold on a game store. <laughs> Um, not all simulations are that demanding. Um, so there's another simulate uh, another software uh, um, planetarium simulation called the Stellarium that uh, uh, that runs on a wider range of computers. Um, I could all run this on my older computer, but uh, fairly well. Uh, although Zoom, even Zoom is fairly demanding these days. That's uh, one of the reasons I got this new laptop because the Zoom session on my old computers were sometimes kind of lagging. So anyways, so, so you can see these orbital mechanics and I can show you the kind of orbital mechanics of the solar system. So let me actually do this. I'm gonna uh, go to sun so that the sun is kind of centered and I'll come back uh, to, I don't know where I'm going. I'm gonna, just gonna press it one more time so that Okay, I have a feeling. Oh, it's because I'm tracking Earthman. That's why it's doing this weird thing. Okay, I get it. Um, okay, so that's Sun. I'm just gonna move away from it, so that uh, I'm gonna just track Sun and move away. Let's see. I think I'm still on the uh, North Pole and uh, turn off track. Okay, so this is a kind of um, kind of the view that's uh, difficult to obtain in real life because in order to have this view of the sun and the planets orbiting around the counterclockwise, you have to be basically above what I would call what's called uh, ecliptic plane. That's the plane of the solar system. And so uh, there, we do have some spacecraft that has gone out of this plane of the solar system. And, um, but you know, it's like the, one of the Voyager spacecrafts have gone in that direction. Uh, but um, that, that journey <laughs> takes a very long time and has to travel through quite a bit of um, uh, void. Because um, most of the, of all of the major planets in the solar system is in this uh, very uh, thin plane. And this uh, actually comes from physics. So these bright green lines, they are all orbits of major planets. So if I go in this view, you can kind of see it. Um, so in the very outermost, this should be, <laughs> guessing I think it's a Neptune. Uh, is it Neptune? Let me try to click it. Uh, yeah, it's Neptune. So Neptune, Uranus. Uh, Uranus, uh, Saturn, it keeps Saturn. Um, yeah, so I, I will show the bodies that are uh, at some angles from the ecliptic plane. Uh, so that's uh, Saturn, and this is Jupiter. By the way, I'm starting with those outer planets to show the scale. This is how far away those outer planets are. And Jupiter, it's uh, the distance is being Oh wait, that's distance from me, not sun. So that might not mean anything. So that's a Jupiter. And all the inner four planets, they're in this tiny circle here. So if I want you to actually see where they are, I really need to zoom in so that you can distinguish them. This is a Mercury. Uh, sorry, those uh, asteroids are really in the way. Um, that's a Mercury, the closest the planet. That's a, um, well, that was Earth, uh, that's Venus, <laughs> and this is Earth, and that's Mars. And um, when we talked about Kepler's laws, we, uh, I, in the lecture, I did talk a little bit about um, how, how um, Kepler, it, it, there was some element of fortune in that Kepler was analyzing motion of Mars. Because when you look at, um, orbit of planets like Venus. This is really close to a circular orbit. So if a Kepler was analyzing orbit of Venus or the, um, yeah, analyzing orbit of Venus, he might have concluded, yes, planets do go around the sun in a perfect circle. And um, that wouldn't have led to the discovery that he did make. And I think Mercury is quite, Mercury does have a quite elliptical orbit, but 
um, Mercury is harder to observe uh, from Earth because it's uh, closer to the sun. So there's uh, many uh, parts of its orbit where it's simply not uh, possible to observe it from the Earth unless you go outside the atmosphere so that you can just see it anytime. And so this is the orbit of Mars. And, you know, imagine it with the sun at the center. I think I'm more or less directly above it so that um, if its uh, orbit is perfectly circled, then this should look perfectly circular. Just uh, notice how close to a circle it is. It is elliptical in that I think the center should be somewhere around here, but the sun is not at the center. It's at one of the two foci uh, or focuses of the ellipse. And uh, and this is how... Uh, 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 how remarkable the level of precision in the data, in Tycho Bryce data that you need to for uh, Kepler to be able to figure out the orbit of the Mars doesn't exactly fit a circle, but it's quite close. So, and th that's, uh, that's why that's the beginning of modern astronomy, one that's uh, um, centered around collection of accurate, reliable data. Um, instead of philosophizing about how the heavenly bodies should move and whatnot. So, um, so the reason we have this uh, um, ecliptic plane, uh, the plane where uh, things, uh, most big things are in, is because of conservation of angular momentum. If you think about life cycle of a solar system like ours, you can imagine a kind of stellar nursery, a cloud that's uh, eventually going to collapse the vast majority of the mass will form this star and the rest of the stuff will um, be hanging around as the planet. And when, when you have a collection of gas, I think it's uh, not too unlikely to imagine that um, that that collection of the gas might be rotating in some direction. It would be actual, it would take a, quite a bit of coincidence for that gas to be perfectly um, kind of not have a net angular momentum it it it, it just uh, it'll have some uh, random value of angular momentum and the thing about the gravitational interaction is that it's a central force it's a force um, that acts uh, along a, a straight line between the two um, objects and with the uh, under influence of central force like a gravity angular momentum is conserved so as the cloud of gas collapses and becomes the solar system, it has to conserve angular momentum. And what that means if a, a mass that's farther away is moving in, it has, if it was orbiting very slowly, it has to um, now orbit, uh, it has to move faster in order to conserve angular momentum. And as it moves faster and faster, at some point there's a kind of a balance. Um, uh, balance between centrifugal force and the force of gravity pulling it in. So, um, so if uh, you imagine angular momentum pointing one way as that uh, cross product vector quantity, in the plane that's perpendicular to that angular momentum, uh, there will be some limit to how close the material can come in. Uh, at some point, their orbital speeds will be enough to keep them in a stable orbit like this. But in the direction perpendicular to that plane, that's where things can collapse all the way down, and that's where you see this plane. So the net angular momentum of the solar system is in the direction perpendicular to this plane. And that's uh, also the reason why when you... So when you look at the solar system, there's a kind of natural direction that everything is rotating in. That's the, that's the direction that corresponds to the net angular momentum of the solar system. So you could imagine the, in the early stages, there might have been some pieces flying around. Uh, in fact, we still have some pieces flying around in the asteroid belt. Uh, there's quite a few asteroids here. And just quite trying to click to the biggest one, uh, Eris. That's the, oh, sorry, Ceres. That's the biggest asteroid. It's the only one in the belt big enough to be classified as dwarf planet. So, uh, there might be some, you know, tiny pieces here and there that's uh, going in the wrong direction. That's orbiting clockwise from this view rather than counterclockwise. 
but if you imagine solar system existing over geological time scale, billions of years, um, when there are objects uh, just flying in, going the wrong way, at some point it's going to hit something else. And um, over those uh, millions, billions of years, with the things colliding, everything will, um, the things that achieve kind of stable arrangement will be the things that are going in the uh, roughly the same direction. Um, so yeah, oh, in this view, so I can also speed up the time to show some of the things that we talked about. We talked about Kepler's law. So you so in the uh, picture of the orbital paths, you've seen illustration of, I guess, Kepler's first law, that the sun is at the center of the ellipse or elliptical orbit. Um, I can demonstrate, uh, can I, Kepler's second law doesn't like hit you like a brick as much as um, Kepler's third law. So I'm gonna speed this up quite a bit so that um, orbit, orbit of Mercury will be, I can't click Mercury. Um, all right, I'm just gonna use this feature. Uh, orbit of Mercury uh, will be relatively fast. Um, I think I need to speed it up a little bit more. So, okay. At this time scale, about one second in the simulation is one day, one Earth day. So uh, you can see how quickly Mercury is moving, not that fast. <laughs> uh, let me speed it up a little bit more so that it looks like uh, Mercury is whizzing by. Okay. That may... So, okay. So in this time scale, we are every second is about half a month maybe um, you can see how quickly mercury is orbiting how quickly venus is orbiting how quickly mars uh, earth is orbiting how quickly mars is orbiting and how quickly jupiter is orbiting and you can i hope you can see that these inner planets are moving faster it's not just that they complete the orbit more quickly it's that they are also moving faster their actual speed is faster so these outer planets uh, uh, they have a long orbital periods like even jupiter the innermost of the outer planets take 11 12 years to complete one orbit around the sun um, and yeah so that's a kind of the view um and so compared to Saturn and Uranus, uh, the Jupiter now looks pretty fast compared to Saturn and Uranus, which are slower than Jupiter. And um, so, yeah, that's Neptune, outermost major planet. And way back in, when was it, 2006, 2007? That's when this redefinition of planets happened. Um, so before then, they didn't really distinguish between uh, major planets and minor planets or dwarf planets. Things were just a planet or not a planet. So in during that time, uh, one of the objects that used to be classified as planet is was Pluto. And I think I can identify Pluto if in this picture with the orbital orbits um, marked. I think I can identify just from the features because there are some things that are just odd, weird about Pluto. Um, so I think it's easier to see if I go out of this plane. So look at the plane from the side view. So with the major planets, as I was saying, they are their orbits are in this tight range of ecliptic plane. One of the things that looks off about Pluto is that orbital Pluto is not in the ecliptic plane. It's at a bit of a, um, at a bit of an extreme angle. And I think, uh, which one would it be? I want to guess that this is Pluto. Let me see. Yeah, that is um, <laughs> very center of Pluto, Charon. Charon is pretty big compared to Pluto. So it's the moon of Pluto. They are both uh, double tidally locked. So, you know, look at the orbit of Pluto, compare it to orbit of the major planet. That's a, kind of the first thing that um, as uh, people were uh, learning more about the properties of Pluto that as they made long enough observation to project its orbit, which actually takes quite a bit of time, <laughs> 250 years, um, that it doesn't fit the same pattern that major planets have. And that's because it's a, um, 
it's kind of a different uh, material, uh, I guess. Um, so these objects that you see um, with the orbits projected out, these are the um, confirmed dwarf planets in the, um, in the, I guess, I guess that they are called the trans-Neptunian object, TNO. Uh, they are, their orbits are mostly beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, so, Make Make. Uh, is this Eris I'm looking for? Oh, yeah. There should be Eris. Oh, I see. Eris is this one. Um, so, Eris, who's the discovery? It's the, uh, it's a, one of the first dwarf planets because it's the discovery of uh, Eris that really put um, status of Pluto as planet kind of in danger because um, there are uh, ways in which Eris is very similar to Pluto. So look at the mass of Eris. That's about 23% of the mass of Moon. And when you look at the mass of Pluto, if I can select the Pluto, I'm just going to use the search feature. So many. So, mass of the Pluto is actually less than mass of Aries, 18% uh, of mass of Moon. So, these two objects are similar in size. Um, and they kind of share similar ish orbit. Eris is maybe a little bit farther out than Pluto is. And, and they are actually, their orbits are so elliptical that there's a, um, portions of their orbit where, um, where Eris is actually inside the orbit of Pluto. But the point is that they are both uh, uh, sim of similar size. So it, it's kind of nonsensical for us to say, oh, Pluto is a planet because we found it earlier. And Eris is not a planet because we found it later. That's just so arbitrary. And we scientists try not to be arbitrary, although often we end up being arbitrary, but we try not to be. So there were, uh, the International Astronomical Union, they were trying to develop some kind of consistent definition. And one criteria that they settled on is the criterion of what's called clearing the neighborhood around its orbit. And it really, that's the thing that you can, a uh, kind of a concrete thing you can look at uh, between the major planets and these many trans-Neptunian objects that are kind of like a planet. They are bigger than asteroids, but <laughs> we kind of want to avoid defining them as planets because there are just so many of them. Uh, it was nice when we had nine planets with Pluto. You know, nine is a nice number. But if we start making Pluto and Eris planet, and we would have to make these planets, then we would end up with 20 or so planets. And um, it's so unwieldy, like the label of planet wouldn't mean anything. So the disting distinction that they settled on was um, um, how do you, the orbital features. So as you look at here, you can see with the orbits of the major planets that um, they are the dominant body within their orbit. There is no other body of a similar size that's uh, occupying the same orbit. And that's kind of a fact of gravity. These uh, major planets are large objects in their orbit. They influence all the other things around their orbit, so either um, Things that are near them either get captured as a moon, um, or or they get accreted into the planet itself, or they get knocked out of the orbit entirely. So um, so all these uh, bright green orbits um, of the major planets they show neighborhoods that's been planned out by the planet, the major planet. These minor planets uh, they are the Kind of, they are big, big enough in their own orbit, but um, but as you look at it, there's quite a bit of overlap between uh, orbits of these different bodies of Pluto and Eris and all these other minor plan dwarf planets. Um, so they haven't cleared their neighbor neighborhood. They are not big enough to um, push away or somehow gravitationally dominate other objects that are in a similar orbit. So. So based on the criteria, 
um, these uh, trans-Neptunian objects, which are also outside of the ecliptic plane, um, they are not major planets. So um, let me show one of the comets. The most uh, famous comet that you might have heard of is Halley's Comet. Um, so that uh, this is another astronomical object whose discovery is prehistoric, as in um, even in the earliest written material, you can um, you can find references to a celestial object that, with uh, our uh, better knowledge of astronomy, we can identify this. Oh, that is Halley's comet. So if uh, Edmund Halley wasn't the person who discovered it, why is it named after him? It's named after him because he's the one who recognized the periodic, uh, periodicity of Halley's Comet, that it's a celestial object that becomes visible in our sky once every uh, 75 years. <laughs> and you know that's uh, suspiciously similar to typical human lifetime. So this is the kind of comet that everyone says maybe once in their lifetime. So appearance of Halley's Comet is um, associated with a superstition like uh, end of world because it's a kind of once in a century thing. Every time it appears, people alive then have never seen it before. It's sign of times, world is ending. Um, and and Haley recognized uh, this uh, kind of sighting. Um, it's occurring on some regular interval. And I think uh, Haley is, um, he's around after uh, Newton's synthesis of his theory of gravity and um, derivation of Kepler's laws based on the mechanics. And, uh, and uh, he, I think, I don't know. I'm a terrible storyteller. I'm a terrible historian. I'm even worse a storyteller. But I imagine um, Haley looked at the records of sighting of the of the comet and recognized that it's a peri there is a periodicity. So it uh, it becomes visible to us when it comes near um, the kind of near the sun in the inner uh, part of the uh, solar uh, solar system. And um, and when astronomers describe a very long period object, uh, they, forgetting the name of the process they go through, um, they can often, with that benefit of identification of the object, they can go back to the historical astronomical records that go back to the, the um, kind of the, the Middle Ages, the Islamic scholars, ancient Chinese records, and uh, with the knowledge of what it is they're looking for, they can identify, oh, this record is referring to actually this uh, Halley's Comet. Um, and they do that with the Halley's Comet and with the other objects as well. Um, so like, you know, Pluto, it has a period of more than 50 years and um, that kind of uh, measurement can be made more precise uh, by look, looking um, Ret retroactively at uh, previous records that didn't fully uh, recognize what that object is. So let me do this. Uh, I think I can use a uh, Halley's Comet to illustrate Kepler's second law. So you can see with this orbit here, uh, I'm trying to move it around so that you can get a better view of the three-dimensional arrangement of um, the Halley's Comet's orbit around the sun. So it is out of outside of the ecliptic plane. Um, it, it's at this angle, and it's a, um, it's a hugely elliptical. So it uh, um, so the focuses of the ellipse that this uh, elliptical orbit is at. So one of them is at the sun, Kepler's first law, and the other one is over here. So it's uh, um, it's elliptical to a degree that none of the planets or dwarf planets are. So let's see what view is the. Let me get to. I think this is um, this. Uh, this is a decent issue. Sorry, I'm making myself dizzy. Uh, I, I think this is decent enough view to kind of see the orbit of uh, Halley's comet. Uh, I'm going to reset the time to our current time. So uh, Halley's Comet last appeared in the 80s. So uh, right now, it's very far from the sun. It's uh, like a halfway point between its uh, two sidings. 
so um so so where it is now you know you can't um so so you, we can calculate where it should be but the core of the comet is so um small that even with the most powerful telescope uh, you, we shouldn't be able to see but that's where it should be based on its known orbital uh, characteristics so i'm gonna speed up the uh, simulation time a little bit so that um, the motion of Halley's Comet in this outer edge is still, you know, visible because it's going to take it another, what, 40 years, 40, 30 years or so to come near the sun. So let me speed up the simulation time uh, enough that it's, uh, it looks like it's moving. Um, okay, maybe that's enough. So I can see that a uh, little dot that's moving there and it's moving slowly. And uh, the simulation is fast enough that every second right now is about a year. And I want you to, and, and I'm just gonna leave the simulation speed alone so that you can make a proper comparison. See how quickly or slowly Halley's Comet is moving. So this, uh, um, so Kepler's second law says that the, the areas, oh, sorry, let me just pause it briefly. The area swept out by the line connecting the, the planetary planet, in, in this case it's comet, but Kepler's second law applies to comets as well. The area swept by line connecting this object to the sun, area swept by that line in some amount of time is equal for all the points in the orbit. So uh, out here, that line was longer so as it moves slowly, the kind of the pizza slice that it's sweeping is uh, fairly sizable. Now, as it's moving in, the line gets shorter. So in order for that line to sweep the same area, the comet will have to move faster and faster. And I'm going to resume the simulation and watch how it gets faster as it gets closer to the sun. So. Uh, near the perihelion, it goes by super fast. So the entire orbit of Halley's Comet, again, is uh, 75 years. This uh, uh, I'm going to just reverse the time a little bit so that we can uh, look at that close approach a little bit uh, in more detail. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just reversing the time a little. Okay, good. Um, going to reverse it again and oh, wait. I can't reverse the while it's paused. Okay. And I'm going to just zoom in a little bit so that we can look at the, the perihelion um, of the Halley's Comet with a little bit more. Okay. And I'm going to slow it down so that, um, so that it doesn't go by so quickly. Okay. Um, so, so as it's entering uh, kind of the range of the asteroid belt where uh, Ceres is. So, so that is around, uh, or that is going to be around the 2061, uh, beginning of that year. Okay. And I don't know if uh, the comet would be visible at that distance. So what makes a comet visible is, let me zoom in with a telescope to see if uh, it might be visible. No, I don't think it would be. So, yeah. So the comet doesn't really become visible until it develops that, um, oh wait, uh, it is developing the tail. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. So you can see that, so the comet's core is a really tiny um, ice, a dirty ice ball. That's the uh, description of comet. And when it's way out far away from the sun, that tiny ice core, um, it's basically not visible. It, 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 it's a, uh, um, yeah, it does it. Yeah, the diameter is 11 kilometers. It's like size of a city, super far away. Can't see it, even with the most powerful telescope. The part of the comet that becomes visible to us is this tail. And uh, let me track the comet so that the camera will just follow it as it gets uh, near the sun and then moves away. So around the beginning of 2061, that's when with a really powerful telescope, you might be able to begin to see the comet and uh, start the simulation again. Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit slower. Um, and 
Um, okay, faster. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because I can't tell where the comet is in its orbit. Uh, it is okay. Uh, it's okay, it's still beyond the orbit of Mars. Let me just uh, track it until when it's uh, inside the orbit of Mars. So somewhere here. Okay. So at this point, the comet would be somewhere um, at a similar distance as how far away Mars is from us. And okay, that doesn't ha seem to have changed all that much. So I'll move the simulation along until it's inside the orbit of Earth. And I think by this point, the tail should be much more visible. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 uh, sunlight is heating up the ice ball, and it's evaporating of stuff from the comet. Um, that stuff is getting pushed out by the 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 uh, solar pressure, uh, radiation pressure from the the light from the sun. And that's forming this tail. And the tail of the comet, it's not tracing the the path of the comet. It always it points away from the sun. And there's it's beginning to develop the two tail. Um, I think the more volatile material uh, points more directly away from the sun. This is the heavier dust. And let's see here, I'm gonna zoom out. And I think by this point is where the comet would be visible to let naked eye observe without any telescope. And it's also near Earth, so that helps too. And as it gets, uh, so this is the perihelion at the closest point to the sun. That's where the tail would be the brightest and biggest. And, uh, and that's the, uh, so the, so the comet was in the view at the beginning of the year, 2061, and uh, around the end of May, June, that's when it's a perihelion, when it's the brightest, it's scaring the most number of people, <laughs> at least before we knew what it was. And it's gonna take another um, few months uh, to move out of the range and, um, and become invisible again. Um, so it's moving out of the range of the orbit of Mars around here. So the comet would have been visible in the night sky for maybe a few months. Um, so, so yeah, that's a um, kind of orbital mechanic uh, illustration that I can show with uh, this simulation. Uh, yeah. Am I? Okay. Yeah, and there are other things I can do, but I see that I'm over time. So I think I'm gonna end it here. Uh, there are, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, there's a lot of fun things in the 